You're okay to be recorded, aren't you? Absolutely. Put you on the internet. Say that again. Put you on the internet. Make you a star. You can get your own techno remix. Say that again. You can get your own techno remix. Like Looks like Bill Riley. Are you going to make that remix, man? Will there be a remix committee? <laughs> yeah. You can make a motion. I, I, my first order of business as a member will be to motion to be the head of the techno remix committee. <laughs> Okay, a passion for destruction is also a creative passion. This is the slogan spray painted on the side of corporate giants in frustrated rebellion. But what is really known of Mikhail Bakunin? His theories of anarchism didn't fully envelop until the mid to late 1860s. His real influence lay in the persistent and convicted activism up until that point. His history then is fairly straightforward and chronological until the first international where he spearheaded his key arguments against Karl Marx and his repressive dictatorship of the proletariat. His personal influence stretched from contemporaries such as Karl Marx and Peter Kropotkin. His arguments carried on to Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman, where his theories are carried today by Noam Chomsky. Bakunin was obviously prolific, but what is lost in translation throughout history and failed anarchist movements of today? Mikhail Alexandrovich Bakunin was born on the 30th of May, 1814, to an aristocratic family in Priam Lukino, just northwest of Moscow. It's important to note that aristocratic families ruled every governing, economic, and social relationship since the 14th century. When Bakunin was just 14, he left for military training for the Russian Imperialist Guard. Just three years after graduating at the Artillery University in 1835, he became disillusioned with aristocratic life. In the heat of taking his sister's side against an unhappy organized marriage, he rebelled against the rest of his family and rejected his father's pleas to continue with the military. Instead, he left to Moscow to study philosophy. He made friends at the local university quickly. In just a few months, he developed a small philosophical circle dedicating, dedicated to presenting new ideas to fellow students. It was during this time that Bakunin developed his ideas of imminence, the idea that divinity innately manifests itself in every material sphere. His life was divine through and through, Bakunin said about Jesus Christ. Full of self-denial, he did everything for mankind, finding his satisfaction and his delight in the disillusion of his material being. Because we have been baptized in this world and are in communion with his heavenly love, we feel that we are divine creatures, that we are free, and that we have been ordained for the emancipation of humanity. Now, coming from the most anti-authoritarian anarchist as he became to be known as, this is an understandable shock, but it's obvious that these ideas were at least fundamental in establishing you know, a basic uh, philosophy of communal living. Um, Bakunin's writing continued to have semi-religious overtones until in the 1860s, where his disgust with theology grew more and more apparent. Bakunin wrote sporadic articles on different subjects from 1840 to 1860. This is known as the Pan-Slavic era, an era of intense and dedicated activism. His real theoretical work came after this period. However, his involvement with some of the following events was crucial in his development. More and more, Bakunin became influenced by Hegelian philosophy while at uh, while at the college, he published the first Russian translation of Hegel's work. In the heat of more conflict with his father, Bakunin left for Berlin in early 1840. In search of a career as a professor, he soon immersed himself with the radical Hegelian left, and soon after joined the socialist movement in Berlin. After developing a passion for socialism, he abandoned his career for the advancement of revolution. There was a convergence of events when the Russian Empire became aware of his radical political involvement and ordered his return to Moscow. At the time of dismissing his pursuit in a career as a priest of truth, as he called it, the time couldn't have been more precise and perfect. He refused to return while knowing his belongings would have been confiscated, his property turned to the Tsar's regime for redistrib redistribution among more prominent nobles. He left with the German poet and revolutionary comrade, George Herwig, to Switzerland. Bakunin became affiliated with William Wettling, who's, whom Engels called the founder of German communism. At this time, Bakunin actually called himself a communist. Um, and while he wrote for the German communist, I'm going to slaughter this, uh, Schweizerich Republicanaire, 
um, the Russian police still chased him. Um, this was around the time that Bakunin wrote The Reaction in Germany, which was the, P the passion for uh, destruction is also a creative passion, um, circa 1842. Um, let's see. Bakunin escaped Waitling's arrest for revolutionary agitation while in Geneva. However, the police reports circulated to the imperialist police. The Russian ambassador in Bern wrote Bakunin calling again for his return to Russia. Bakunin, of course, went to Brussels instead. This was the first time that Bakunin heard of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. It's important to note that Bakunin, at this time, was self-admittedly a non-intellectual, as he called himself. He had little developed theory at this point. What makes him, like I said, what makes him worthwhile is his dedication to um, these various uprisings in Europe. Um, uh, within the next four or five years, oh, 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 oh shit, let's skip that shit, that's... <laughs> Specifically in Brussels, Bakunin met Jochem Luluel. Luluel was a notable and enthusiastic historian who escaped Poland and helped form the Democratic Society for Unity and Brotherhood of All Peoples, in conjunction with Marx and Engels. Poland was going through a people's revolution called the Greater Poland Uprising. Um, and to give some background, uh, the people of Poland mounted an armed military insurrection against uh, Prussian forces. The Prussian army, with political and financial support of the imperialist Russia, later squashed these uprisings. They were slaughtered. Later in a speech that commemorated the insurrection, he called for an alliance of Polish and Russian peoples towards the definitive collapse of despotism in Russia. What's significant is Bakunin's background um, in this event, seeing his home, imperialist Russia, uh, suppress these uprisings of self-determination in favor of economic interests. And not just, when, um, not just within Poland, but with Prussia, who directly suppressed them. Um, with the political background set, Bakunin, Bakunin's criticism of this dispute clashed with Luluel, a Polish nationalist, because he fought for the autonomy of non-Polish people caught the crossfire, um, so to speak. Um, another criticism that Bakunin made was against the Polish clergy. He felt that they didn't logically and accurately portray um, the Polish people. They pursued private interests and in some cases supported uh, the Prussian um, invasion and suppression. Um, in, uh, in 1844, Bakunin went to Paris, which was the hot spot for European radicalism. He established contacts with Pierre-Joseph Brabon and Karl Marx. It was here that Emperor Nicholas issued a decree stripping Bakunin of his title and his privileges as a noble. Should the Russian authorities ever get their hands on him, he would be convicted to a lifelong exile in Siberia. Bakunin, of course, again responded with a lengthy response, uh, denouncing the emperor as a despot and, and calling for democracy in Poland and Russia. <coughs> Around this time, some Russian authorities speculated at Bukunin being a Russian agent who had exceeded his orders. He'd escaped every attempt to arrest um, with policing networks from Prussia, Switzerland, Germany, London, Brussels, and now, while he was in Paris, Paris. Um, Bakunin continued to speak out and remain active. Um, it's, inter uh, it's interesting to speculate his call for various European alliances as a precursors to uh, the events that were about to happen, um, such as the Paris Commune. Um, before that, however, the, the, the revolutions of 1848 broke out, and Bakunin is ecstatic. Uh, the springtime of peoples, as it came to be known, was a collection of European insurrections that broke out in Italy, France, Germany, Denmark, Hungary, and Switzerland. And it was generally, as Alexis de Tocqueville put it, Society was cut in two, those who had nothing united in common envy, and those who had anything united in common terror. With states' few individual political motivations, this was generally the case. Tens of thousands of people were killed and tortured um, fighting for self-determination and democracy in their city-states. Um, the political and social foundation of Europe had been shaken uh, by radicalism and the emergence of socialism. Despite the huge social impact these uprisings gave birth to, there was no huge systematic political change. There was just social change, and again, the precursor to these bigger events that were about to happen. 
1849, there was a continued insurrection in Dresden. Bakunin was key in preparing and organizing the, offensive, the defenses against Prussian troops. The defenses were squashed against the ill-equipped peoples of Dresden. Bakunin was captured. His comrade Richard Wagner wrote about the event. He had to submit his huge beard and bushy hair to the tender mercies of the razor and shears. A small group of friends watched the operation, which had to be executed with a dull razor, causing him no little pain, under which none but the victim himself remained passive. We bade, we bade farewell to Bakunin with the firm conviction that we should never see him alive again. The Prussians sent him to rot in the notorious Peter and St. Peter and St. Paul fortress. Emissaries of the emperor requested a confession to break Bakunin spiritually and thusly physically. Since all his actions were known, he had no secrets at this point, and he said, you want my confession, but you must know that a penitent sinner is not obliged to implicate or reveal the misdeeds of others. I have only the honor and conscience that I have never betrayed anyone who has confided me, and this is why I will not give any names. And for Nicholas responded, he is a good lad, full of spirit, but he is a dangerous man, and he must be watched. He spent three years in the confines of the Peter and Paul fortress. Afterwards, he was moved to the castle Schlisselburg. It was here that he suffered from scurvy. All his teeth fell out, yet he's, he found some relief in mentally reenacting re the legend of Prometheus. Following the death of Nicholas I, the new emperor Alexander removed Bakunin's name off the amnesty list. In February of 1857, of seven years in exile, or uh, in prison, excuse me, his mother's pleas were heard by the emperor. Bakunin was sent to permanent exile in the western uh, Siberian city of Tomsk. It was here that Bakunin found and married Antonia Kwiatkowska, the daughter of a Polish merchant. During this time, he also received a visit from his second cousin, General Count Nikolai Moryvyov Amursky. The cousin, this General Count, had been governor of Eastern Siberia for over 10 years and quickly grew to like Bakunin because of his liberal sympathies. The two became closer, and, in, and Bakunin was eventually hired to work for the Emmer Development Agency. His title, a commercial traveler. He quickly grew, grew bored of this um, in contrast to the type of activist work he was doing before. And um, he was, but he, he was making hundos. So he was racking in money, and you know, he was, he was planning something, right? Um, Contemplating his escape from exile, he got the general count governor's permission to leave under company business, as he called it. Um, in June of 1861, his, he found his way to a Russian port on the far east side of Siberia, um, abandoning, uh, uh, um, abandoning a company r Russian merchant ship. He eventually persuaded his way onto an American ship. The SS Vickery took him to the northernmost island of Japan. On August 6th, he arrived, he arrived in Yokohama, Japan. He left Yokohama on the USS, USS Carrington and arrived in San Francisco on October 15th of the same year, leaving remnants of personal stories of radiating personal and political influence. He still yearned to be back in Europe. Um, so at this point, before transcontinent, before uh, transcontinental railroads, the quickest way um, to the East Coast of the U.S was through Panama. So he goes through Panama. Um, uh, stopping in Boston sometime between Panama and December of 27th, once he arrived in London, um, he actually met some comrades from the, uh, the revolutions of uh, 1848. Um, it, feeling inspires Feeling inspired by seeing his comrades, he left for New York, and after leaving New York, arrived in Liverpool on December 27th. Um, in the light of his travels, he immediately immersed himself with the revolutionary movement. He left to see his old teacher and friend, Alexander Herzen, and began to plan his next course of action. After making a brief trip to Italy and involving himself in a small campaign of Italian Slavic unity, he re reunited with his wife. In 1863, he first started to develop his ideas of anarchism. He implemented an idea of a secret organization of revolutionaries to carry on propaganda work and prepare for direct action. 
Um, and I, I thought that this was incredibly interesting because I actually found a source that um, said that Marx refuted the idea of a, a people's revolution. Um, but I, I have to speculate because uh, Marx and Bakunin hated each other. And uh, I think maybe Marx was just trying to put Bakunin down. So, um, but I thought that this was significant and I believe Paul Talley actually said Lenin was inspired by this um, one piece from Bakunin. It was the only thing that he thought had any merit. Um, so he writes, uh, this is the biography, anybody should check it out if you're interested in Bakunin. He says, in contrast to the top-down model of revolution, Bakunin held that revolutions are never by, made by individuals or even secret societies. They make themselves produced by the force of affairs, by the movement of events and facts. They are prepared in the depth of the instinctive consciousness of the masses. Then they burst out, instigated, instigated by what often appears to be, a, to be frivolous causes. All that a secret, well-organized society can do is to help at birth of a revolution by spreading the ideas that correspond to, those, to the instincts of the masses and to organize not the revolutionary army, the army must always be the people, but a sort of revolutionary general staff composed of individuals who are devoted, energetic, intelligent, and most important, sincere and lacking ambition and vanity, capable of serving as intermediaries between the revolutionary idea and the popular instinct. Um, so, yeah, that, uh, that has huge political and uh, historical implications, like I said specifically with, with Lenin. Um, so after his, uh, his brief campaign of promoting Italian Slavic unity, um, he went on to promote uh, what he called the Alliance of Revolutionary Socialists based on this idea. Um, he recruited Italians, Frenchmen, Scandinavians, and uh, Slavs, um, and by 1866 he informed Herzen of his work. Uh, he then had further contacts in Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Belgium, and England. Um, the Alliance, Bukunin boasted, declares itself atheist. It wants the abolition of cults, substitution of science for faith, and human justice for divine justice. In Catechism of a Revolutionary, he demanded opposition toward, towards religion and the state, advocating absolute rejection of every authority. In 1840, Bakunin led a failed uprising in line which foreshadowed the Paris Commune. Its organization mirrored the exact composition um, that the Paris Commune arts, the Paris Commune, uh, used just not a year later. Um, he wrote to the Frenchman, we must spread our principles, not with words, but with deeds, for this is the most popular, the most potent, and the most irresistible form of propaganda. And this is what became to be known as propaganda of the deed, uh, carried by, of course, Alexander Bergman, um, who was imprisoned for advocating the death of, of President McKinley. Um, in 1868, he joined the Geneva, the Geneva section of the First International. He encompassed the arguments from mutualists, American individualist anarchists, and his own anarcho-collectivists against Marxism. For four years, the battle raged between Bakunin and Marx, and uh, it's highly arguable that somebody could give a presentation on this, this fight, because it went on for so long, it was so full of shit talk, um, and they all just, I, I, think, I think Marx called Bakunin uh, a raging ass in, at, at one point, so they were just making stabs um, at each other. Uh, it was obvious that Marx had inherent followers from the theor theoretical groundwork he laid. Bakunin, on the other hand, struggled to maintain his reputation from his activism. In 1872, Mikhail Bakunin was expelled on the from the Internationale because of his secret organizations and the history of his political work. Um, uh, and in this case, it was obviously referred to uh, the newly organized Alliance of Revolutionary Socialists. Bakunin helped head a separate working men's association uh, similar to the international later in Switzerland. Uh, Bakunin went on to die from the effects of bad health. Uh, there's nothing more specific 
than that that I found in Bern, Switzerland in 1876. Um, so that's it. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> yes. Um, what were you? Where were well, I was, I was going to sort of touch on, you mentioned this, this quote you read at length on um, Bakunin and his secret societies. Um, I, I, at first I would ask, you, know, you, you speculated, but where did, do you know where the quote came from? How, or at least the quote in, as it pertains to its influence on Lenin? Uh, I think it, it, was some, it was some source on, on the internet, and it was uh, about the battle between Marx and Bakunin. Mm -hmm. um, I could get back to you for, you know, further, further details on that. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, does that answer and your question? That's good enough. I mean, I guess we can sort of play with it as it is. But, I mean, it seems to me what Lenin was arguing as far as, I mean, he argued, right, it, 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 this is mostly from what has to be done. But it's sort of like, oh yeah, we should have a vanguard, which again, most theoretically advanced aspects of the working class, students, intellectuals, full time, they become full time revolutionaries, uh, disseminate class consciousness via agitation and propaganda to the people. Uh, once the people raise a sufficient level of class consciousness, we seize the state, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But it seems to me what Bakunin was arguing was more or less, I mean, obviously he's not going to go along seizing the state and doing the dictatorship of the proletariat, but it's sort of this, oh, well, when the people have enough consciousness and maybe give them guns, like, maybe then a revolution will happen. Do you think that's what he's arguing, or do you think it's more, like, actual structured and organized? I, I would speculate, because of his past and his his activism, I think it would be a combination of the objective conditions and his alliance of revolutionary socialists. However, my criticism to Bakunin is, um, in some cases, he didn't argue for armed uh, struggle, and in some cases, he actually fought against it. And um, I think the groundwork that he laid for uh, propaganda, the deed, um, just, I feel like, it, really, I, I feel like that was the downfall of anarchism from that point, because after that, um, a lot of people who had networked with him before just started carrying out these mindless acts of like, you know, killing nobles and, and killing aristocrats and shit like that, which... Uh, in principle, I'm not against that, but also if, if, if that's your program for revolution, then it's not gonna work out. <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody wants to take out the BPO executives, more power to yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so, but I, I had a few questions that I just wanted to kind of discuss as a group. Um, he wrote God and, the, God and the State in 1871 in the heat of the International, and in it he wrote, the idea of God implies the application of human reason and justice. It is the most decisive negation of human liberty and necessarily ends in the enslavement of mankind in theory and practice. And I wanted to about the implications of this and our struggle today. And uh, so that's, that's my first one. I wanted to revolve around. And secondly, um, his biggest work um, is uh, Statism and Anarchy. Um, uh, and I wrote, Bakunin accepted Marx's economic and class analysis, but stated, liberty without socialism is injustice. Socialism without liberty is slavery. Um, what do you guys think about that? First, what do you think about God and the state, and then the second, statism and anarchy? Greg? I think it actually shows a, a, a really deep lack of theological knowledge. I mean, there are as many gods as there are people, and a lot of the sorts of conceptions of God don't necessarily fall into either um, an authoritarian sort of God, or they uh, don't necessarily entail the advocation of, of human freedom. Mm -hmm. um, for example, the deist god, right? The deist god just winds up the world, let it go, uh, lets it go and run. Right. And deists uphold, right, that human reason is a divine gift from God which allows for the possibility of freedom. Um, and in that case, since God is indifferent to the world, doesn't intervene, doesn't command, then you know it, it doesn't in, yeah it doesn't entail then that 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 sort of god is dominating i mean if he's referring to you know a hard line lutheran or catholic god then yeah of course right but again i i think that shows a, a dearth of knowledge 
on what theology. Would, would you say he's, he's trying to speak to the majority of people in the world? And I wouldn't say the majority of them are deists. And I, I, I would say, I mean, most people that are religion tend to be, be theists, otherwise, it just seems in that time period at least. But so if you're going to write a paper, you're mostly going to direct it to the theists and not really the deists because. I, I feel like his background gave him, well, I mean, you know, he grew up in a traditional aristocratic family, and I feel like, seriously, he was, I feel like he was fucked up from his childhood, and that's, you know, kind of grew this, this um, kind of stemmed the, the whole idea of, of godlessness, and in addition to, um, you know, the clergy in Poland who, you know, he sympathized, you know, tremendously. I feel like those are those are two that you know really lay the groundwork to why he said that. So, just just to provide context, I think. Yeah, well, it's, it's unfortunate that Will's not here. But I mean, right? You could take the Mormon Church as it is currently, like how it functions, very hierarchical. Like you have your parents and your bishop, general authorities, right? It goes on up the line. It's very bureaucratic in that sense, regarding how people are educated, brought up in the church. And so, yeah, you can you can be very reactionary towards that and very, become very anti-authoritarian and have it screw up your childhood and basically scar you for the rest of your life. And that's one way to accept the Mormon Church. But then you can do what Will does, which again, sucks that he's not here, and actually go into the scriptures and say, look, actually what it's preaching is socialism and social justice, and this is what how we ought to be responding to the text. Yeah, not absolutely. Having right, these general authority figures or the president of the church necessarily tell us what it means. right? So that's that little layer of interpretation that just seems unnecessary. So in a sense what I want to say, right, you can do this pretty much with most religions, right? You can actually read it yourself, reason out for yourself, um, even with another movement like liberation theology. So I mean, it's, I mean, these are sort of, I'm sort of responding directly to the question you asked, what does it mean for us today? Like, mm -hmm. those are some pathways for yeah. us, but I think most of us, I don't want to speak for everybody, actually, you know, that's not, but, um, Sort of, I, I don't. I don't have. Well, I'll speak for myself then, right? I don't have necessarily a part of religion for revolution. Well, I mean, just responding to Nathan, um, and a little bit to what you said. Of course, you can have the context of reacting to religion, um, and that should be uh, always kept in mind. But I, I think my criticism of Bakunin, and I'm going to generalize it, my criticism of most anarchists, is they're not theoretically rigorous, and that plays itself out badly in practice. So, um, I mean, let me give two examples. Uh, one which is not so much a good example, and one which is an incredibly good example. Nietzsche was raised by incredibly religious families, and a lot of the stuff he has is just blatantly and harshly um, anti-religious. But if you examine his uh, works carefully, there's actually a lot of sympathy to certain religious aspects. Um, like for all of his criticisms of Christianity, he also recognizes the positive good that it has in showing for concern for other people uh, as a, a radical break from Roman sort of viciousness of like being a predator. Um, so you can, you can have that sort of, those sharp criticisms of, of religion, but then also include, um, you know, the actual, uh, a, a complex view of it, um, which I didn't find at least, and this was years ago that I read, you know, God and the State. Um, but the second thing is, uh, the second person I would refer you to is Marx. And in fact, Marx's view of religion is so theoretically sophisticated that usually his enemies distort his view to make it more simple, right? Everyone has heard Marx say that religion is the opiate of the masses. Now, on its face, that's something absolutely that Bakunin, I think, as far as I can tell, would agree with. But if you read the actual passage, what he says is that religion is the soul of a soulless world. And a religious pain is also a real pain. And it's a humanity in an inhuman world. And so he recognized theoretically aspe uh, the theoretical aspect whereby religion was also, it was a negative force in that it deferred revolutionary struggle, but also that it, it had a real human sentiment and a real human grounding in human suffering that was a sort of valuable humanism. So, I mean, that's what I would say is we should be, I, I'm an atheist, a radical atheist, and I believe in being fiercely critical of religion, but for our concrete studies today, what we need to do is just that. We need to be critical of religion, 
um, which means a critical analysis, breaking it down into its parts, and an evaluation on a part-by-part -part basis, you know, and, and, and finding what is valuable. For example, Mormon um, communitarianism and planned socialism is something that's valuable in it textually, but its patriarchy and hierarchy in this respect is not. And so that's what I would advocate for. Absolutely. Um, now, I, th I thought it was... Uh, what was your second question, by the way? Yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to get into. I thought it was worthy to note that he organized um, not just the defenses in line, but uh, the governing aspects in line, which, which the Paris communards took. So um, I believe you told me something, Greg, about uh, Soviets being modeled after the Paris communes. Um, I, what, what do you think about that in relation to anarchism? And do you think that um, uh, in some cases, you know, the Soviet system, uh, you know, reflects this idea of liberty without socialism is injustice, socialism without liberty is slavery? Well, actually, I, I want to I ask a, a clarifying point. Um, in your research, what did you find about the relationship between Bakunin and Blanqui? Blanc, I, I haven't heard Blanqui. Okay, so I, I mean, I'm going to actually I'm gonna I'm gonna be a really big jerk right now to you and also to uh, whoever did that biography. Um, but Blanqui, I mean, it, it's hard retroactively to believe this because clearly, for all of us living in this modern period, Marxism is the most important revolutionary philosophy. Sorry, anarchists. But like historically speaking, right, Marxism, communism has covered more of the world, had more of an impact. Right, whether you think that's positive or negative. Um, but as a matter of fact, in the 19th century, Blanqui was actually, Blanqui and Proudhon. Was it Blanqui and Russian? Uh, I actually believe it was French. He traveled around a lot. Um, and in fact, Blanqui had a big hand in the revolution, the, the, the you know, Paris Revolution of uh, 48. And once again, in a lot of, Blanqui has had a large influence in the people's uprisings outside. So I just find it odd that, you know, in, in a, especially since um, both Bakunin and Lenin were accused of Blanquiism. Like uh, Rosa Luxemburg in the Second International actually accused Lenin of being a Blanquist rather than a Marxist. And so it's just odd that, uh, I mean, I, I would attribute most of, just from my research of that organization to Blanqui, um, as for the Soviets, yes, it's good in general and in principle to have, you know, liberty, you know, liberty without socialism is injustice and socialism without liberty is, is tyranny. But those are, to, I, I, again, I'm trying not to be sectarian, so I'm just going to quote Lenin, right, is uh, what Lenin says in his notes on anarchism is that the entire history of anarchism has given us nothing but empty platitudes, right? What does that mean to have a certain amount of liberty? Um, is that a liberty to go to whatever job you want? Okay, maybe so, if that seems possible, given context. Does it mean the liberty to uh, shoot up a bunch of heroin and drive your car wherever you want? That seems less so. Um, and again, I, it's, it, I, what I'm not doing is saying, oh, anarchists are so dumb they can't figure out that people probably shouldn't be allowed to shoot up heroin and drive their cars around. But the problem is how that gets played out is through a rigorous theoretical analysis rather than a sort of platinum phrase about the ills of, of tyranny. What is Blanquism? Well, Blanquism is a, a form of insurrectionary socialism that is strongly anarchistic, strongly libertarian. It, 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 he, I think, was the first to coin, or one of the main popularizers of the phrase, uh, libertarian socialists. And so he was a big fan of armed insurrection. And in fact, the Blanquias uh, were, were, were actually numerically the major force of the Second Paris Commune in 93. Um, but it was the Marxists who gave the better analysis and had the better structure that it became more and more attached to the Marxists rather than the Blanquias. So that, that would be Blanqui. Most of Blanqui has been taken up by anarchism, um, especially propaganda, the deed, um, that sort of thing. But yeah, I mean, so it's good to have revolutionary cities, i.e. Soviets, i.e. communes, um, but ultimately if they're squashed and everyone is executed, I, I don't think that that's optimal. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Does anybody have any other questions? Um, was that the only um, piece of literature you referred to? Uh, no. Um, I got recommended actually by Paul Talley. He's, he's a Bukuninist. Um, he gave me like three different biographies on Bakunin. Um, he gave me selected read, readings of the nine greatest anarchists, thinkers or something, something along that line. So. And that's my question. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay.